Hey, what's up, you guys? It's Bloody Jacob here to bring you my weekly strain review. This week we got the episode which was entitled For Services Rendered. And, uh, as you can hear, I do have some notes here. I know on last week's uh, episode review I said I wasn't going to be taking notes anymore. And while I prefer just remembering stuff off the top of my head, I think it feels a little bit more natural in taking notes. Um, the reason why I took notes this week again is because I will be starting my final year of high school next week. And because of that, I'll be a lot more busy. Um, I was considering not doing any more strain reviews until the finale to give myself a little bit of a break. You know, because of all the stuff I'm going to be having to do with school going on again, but I didn't really want to do that. So, I'm going to try to continue doing these strain reviews from week to week up until, of course, the season ends and we have to wait till next summer. But, uh, and I figure with school going on, it'd be a good idea to start taking notes for every episode because with school going on, the show airs on Sunday night and when I usually do the review in the morning or like the very early afternoon like I'm doing right now, I probably won't be able to do a review until after I get home from school, which is going to be like about 3 after 3 o'clock or so, after 3 p.m., so it might be a good idea for me to have like a paper to look at, you know, to remind me of the episode from the previous night. So I'll probably still remember stuff anyway, but it's just probably a safer bet safer, more organized kind of thing to do with all that going on again. So, yeah, 12th grade, man, 12th grade. So, almost over. Just have to, you know, buckle down this year and not fail any classes and I'll be alright. So, yeah, so anyway, I'm going to be reviewing this episode and, uh, we got another creepy opening. Um, I forget her name, but, you know, the lawyer, the attorney... Um, Jude or something like that or Judy or uh, something you know we see her husband coming home and he's at a bar and you know the town's pretty quiet and he eventually takes a cab back to the house and if you remember the attorney you know she was kind of sniffing her children the previous week before you know nanny took him back to her house so yeah it's kind of raining over here if you couldn't hear that but, uh, and maybe I should close the window. Hold on a second, guys. I'm not sure how distracting that was for you, but to me, that was a little, eh. So, okay, we're back. The husband comes home in a cab, and, uh, you know, he's asking why it's so quiet around here, and the cab mentions, oh, it could be the eclipse, and he doesn't really give him any further details. And, uh, yeah, we basically see the husband get out of the car, and then, you know, there's a, a vampire shows up, a more random one, and, you know, kind of walks in front of him, and, then, uh, of course, he gets pretty freaked out and runs back to the cab, and... You know, he gets in the car and tells the guy to drive. But, of course, the guy doesn't drive. He's like, oh, what, what the fuck's going on, you know? Ugh. And then, uh, instead of driving away when the husband told him to, the guy gets out of the car and shoots one of the vampires. I think he actually manages to kill one of them or injure him pretty severely. But uh, he's quickly surrounded by more of them and, you know, easily killed with a clump to the neck and things like that. And then the husband tries to get out of the car, and he manages to get inside his house. And, uh, unfortunately, he's confronted by his full, the fully transformed attorney wife. And, you know, she just walks up to him, you know, her hair is all mangly, and, you know, her eyes are just completely miscolored. And, yeah, she, she starts bringing the tone out, and then it cuts to black. So, yeah. So the attorney is fully transformed now. And to get more follow-up on that later, which I'll get to a little bit later in the review. So yeah, another... I like how they have these, you know, creepy, you know, type of openings. Just like the one with Thomas uh, a while ago. You know what I mean? 
you know, with the, him pulling the chain and, you know, putting that guy on the little uh, platform and just, you know, so he could go into his neck. Yeah, so I like how they have those types of openings pretty often. Um, let's see. You know, one of the earlier scenes we got was with uh, Ephraim and Nora and Abraham. You know, they were in the basement to uh, Abraham's pawn shop. And, you know, they were discussing the virus. And, you know, Ephraim still has the idea that, you know, they have some solid evidence. They have proof, you know, he wants to get it out into the public, you know, so everyone can be aware of it. But, uh, you know, of course, Abraham disagrees, you know, saying that would never work, and it would just, you know, basically cause people to either panic completely and send the whole thing into chaos, or no one would believe him anyway. So, you know, his idea is to find the source, which is the master, and, you know, they're talking about the master, and, you know, that's when they come up with the idea to, you know, follow Thomas, or, you know, somehow find a way to discover where the master is being kept. Or where he's staying, so yeah. So that's really hatch that brilliant idea, and I don't know. I guess it's kind of debatable who you should really agree with on that. I mean, on one hand, I understand Ephraim wanting to expose the truth and let everyone know, and at least maybe more people, some people, will be more aware of what's going on. Those who choose to believe it. But at the same time, they might not, and that would cause a lot... Of, it would cause a lot of trouble and chaos. But, uh... I don't know, at the same time, I mean... Are they that confident they can kill the Master in just that small group? I'm not sure. Because Ephraim's not really that experienced yet, neither is Nora. And Abraham, yes, he is, but he's having a lot of trouble with his body and his health and his condition. So I'm not sure if trying to track down the Master by themselves it's the smartest idea either at this point but uh, well it's still a good show um let's see and we also got another smaller thing with uh gus um you know he was taken into jail and you know he's with his larger friend and it appears his friend is infected because you know we seen that worm get on his hand a while ago and i guess uh, it was enough to infect him and uh Close the window, but I'm not sure if he still heard that thunder there. So, but uh, yeah, his friend is infected from that worm in the hand earlier, and you know he's starting to you know be hurting, and you know uh, Gus sort of forces all the other guys sitting on the bench off of it and lets his friend sit down there and he lay on there and he's trying to comfort him. So yeah, it's gonna be pretty bad if his friend turns and he's like all large and a vampire and that everyone's just gonna be trapped in that cell. I imagine that could lead to a pretty gruesome scene, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. I'm not sure what they're going to really be doing with Gus going forward. Um, I don't know how long he's going to last, but we'll see what they do. Um, let's see. Hey, we also got some uh, flashbacks to um, Abraham being at the concentration camp, you know, back when the... There it is again back when the whole Hitler thing was going on, and, you know, of course, you know, like we knew the previous week, you know, Thomas was one of the heads, or the head at that particular Nazi camp, and, you know, we basically see that Thomas discovered, uh, like a Jewish carving that Abraham had made, and he was asking everyone in the little bunker to his lairs, and, you know, then he sh shoots one of the guys. He says he's gonna keep shooting him one by one until, you know, person one person came forward and took credit, and Abraham eventually, you know, said it was his, and you know, Thomas actually commended him on his carving skills, and then he brought him to a certain room and he said he has like a special project for him and he said you know you are free from all your other work except this and you know, we basically see the br blueprints to the coffin, you know, that the master was brought in in the first episode, so, and we get, like, a couple more flashback scenes throughout the episode, you know, basically, Thomas getting drunk, and them getting into an argument over, you know, what's going on with, uh, the Nazis and the Hitler and all that, and, yeah, so, the big takeaway from that, though, great acting from the guy who plays, um, Thomas, too, I forget his name, 
Uh, give me a second, I can get his name. I apologize. Just give me one more second. Okay, yeah, Richard Samuel. I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name again, man, but you are doing a great job. At, uh, you know, some really good acting, especially when you came in drunk to Abraham and things like that. That was some pretty cool scenes. Um, as far as the guy goes who's playing the younger version of Abraham, he's sort of a he's sort of average, I think, but I don't know. I mean he I guess he does the what he's told to do pretty well. I I mean like he does his role well enough to where it's, you know, serviceable and you know, tolerable and things like that. So those scenes are pretty cool, pretty interesting. And um let's see. And, uh, you know, eventually Ephraim, Nora, and Abraham arrive at Jim's house, and, you know, because Jim actually feels like he should help them, and he's trying to tell his wife some things about it, and he's trying to get her to leave town, but she's not really understanding what's happening, and even after Abraham and Ephraim talk to her, you know, she's still saying they're oh, either crazy, don't let them manipulate you. And so, yeah, she eventually leaves and, you know, drives off to who knows where. But, uh, I think she's given a silver knife or something like that, but could be wrong. But, uh, yeah, so you kind of understand, you know, Jim's situation there, you know, the whole thing with, uh, letting Gus drive past with the van, I mean, with the van and the coffin in the back. You know, he didn't really know it was in there. He didn't really know it was in there for sure. And, you know, of course, you have to understand his, um, you know, him being so desperate because his wife has cancer. So, of course, he's going to take any measure to get some of the treatment, you know, at a cheaper rate or just any way he can, you know, to get on a list or something. So, I don't really think he's really all that bad. I mean, I think it's obvious that he's a good guy at heart, but, you know, he just really wanted to get his wife any chance he, he could get her. He could get her, so, uh, yeah. But, you know, he does say he's gonna try to help Ephraim and all of them, and he's gonna, you know, stick with them. And he leaves a message for Thomas. Um, you know, when Thomas visits Palmer, Palmer tells him that, uh, hold on, yeah, Palmer. And, you know, he tells Thomas that he has a message, and you know, it's basically Jim on the phone telling him he's done and he's gonna leave, but he wants all this money, and he wants Thomas to meet him. So, and then Thomas basically knows it's a setup because he acknowledges that Jim probably wouldn't have it in him to set something up like this or try anything like that on his own, and so he immediately suspects Abraham, which he's right. So, but Abraham is also right at the same time that basically Thomas's arrogance and his uh, stubbornness, you know, just forces him to show up anyway, even knowing it's, it's probably a trap or like an ambush. So, yeah, you know, Thomas goes to meet him at the, you know, I think it's like a train station, and, you know, we basically see, you know, Jim talk to him for a second, and, you know, Thomas is, you know, kind of threatening him, and it looks like he's gonna, you know, take a but yeah, I was neck with a ton, but then, you know, of course, Jim reminds me all, all these people are around, and, you know, all the cops will be right on him when he kills him, you know what I mean? So Thomas leaves, and, you know, Jim basically tells Thomas that, you know, he's chosen to work with Abraham, and, you know, Thomas quickly realizes that and things like that, so Thomas leaves, you know, he's all stoic and stiff walking through the crowd, and he gets on the train, but... You know, Ephraim, Nora, and Abraham are trying to follow him, or at least, like, um, it looks like Nora and Ephraim have, like, the silver guns, I'm guessing, or guns, maybe, to try and subdue him, and maybe get him to tell him something, I'm not sure. I really doubt Thomas would, but, uh, I think their main objective is just to follow him to the source, and, uh, of course, we see, uh, Thomas sort of realizes that he's being followed, so he kind of you know, he kind of manages to lose Ephraim and Nora, but he is eventually confronted by Abraham when he tries to get on the train. 
Um, they both get off the train and, you know, they have a conversation with each other and, you know, Thomas basically tells him, did you really think I'd be stupid enough to, you know, lead you to the master? And, you know, of course, Abraham takes a couple of swings at him with that sword. You know, Thomas says he's going to make, you know, the master's going to be happy to get his sword back. <coughs> Excuse my voice crack. You know, he says the master's going to be happy to get his sword back and, you know, like, uh, Abraham is really... He would be good with those swings, but, you know, he's just at such an old age and his health is worsening. So, you know, Thomas easily manages to block him and, you know, catch the sword as it's swinging at him. So, uh, yeah, and he's about to, looks like he's finally about to kill Abraham, and then all of a sudden, like, a, you know, the silver shot, you know, hits his leg, and you see Ephraim and Nora coming up, and you know, Thomas jumps on to, like, the oncoming train, and then he gets away. So, yeah, Thomas nearly killed Abraham there. He was likely about to until, you know, Ephraim and Nora intervened right there. But, uh, yeah, so that was some pretty cool stuff. You know, we finally got to see some physical confrontations between these main characters here, so that was some really cool stuff, I thought. And, uh, yeah, I'm still not, I'm kind of questioning, even if uh, Thomas did lead him right to the master, what would be their plan there? I mean, they're just, Abraham's experienced, very experienced, but he's at poor health and his body's in a b bad condition, so, and Ephraim and Nora, yes, they have those guns, but they're pretty inexperienced and they don't know what they're doing, especially up against someone as old as Thomas and the, plus the master and all his power. So I'm not really, sh <laughs> I'm not really sure if they thought that was a fantastic idea, but uh, oh, whatever. There's still some exciting stuff with Thomas at the train station, so that was nicely done. You know, my, minus those little uh, questionable points to their plan, but still some nice stuff. And uh, let's see, did I miss anything? Oh, I I know I still have to talk about something here, but. Okay, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything wrote down. And, you know, that lawyer, you know, the attorney being at the house, you know, after killing her husband, you know, we see the nanny at her home and she still has the children. And her daughter comes in and basically says, you can't keep these children, you have to bring them back to their parents. And, you know, she tries to tell her daughter, you know, try to explain it to her, but her daughter just basically thinks she's crazy for some reason. And so her daughter basically forces the nanny to bring the children back, but, you know, she's a nurse, so the nanny makes her promise, you know, after she sees, you know, the woman, you know, that sick, you know, she'll, you know, take the children back, and, you know, uh, well, the daughter says, that, oh, if she's sick, you know, I'll know what to do. No, you won't. <laughs> but, uh, so they go back to the attorney's house, and they, uh, they go in the house, the children rush in there, you know, and then the nanny tries to chase after him and slow him down. But they eventually uh, scream, and then we see him, they find their father's dead body. And, uh, yeah, eventually that leads to the mother coming out again. And, you know, again, she has that mangled hair and the messed up eyes and the more skeletal appearance. And, uh,. Yeah, so they basically run off. And, you know, they show parts of this throughout the episode. But eventually it leads to them, you know, uh, barricading themselves in a room, like a glass room. Like with a glass, um, uh, glass walls and things like that. They barricade themselves in there and, you know, they hide behind a desk. But, you know, of course there's other vampires in there and, you know, they start bashing the glass down. And eventually they break in there. And just as the mother, you know, is bringing the tongue out, it looks like she's going to go right for her daughter. All of a sudden, like, a silver, something silver hits her right in the head and kills her. And the other vampires are immediately killed as, as well by whatever fired that. And then all of a sudden we see these guys step out. They're, they look like they're in, like, a SWAT type of gear. You know, all, all of them are wearing helmets except for this one. He's wearing a hood. I mean, look, he looks really, really creepy. <laughs> um... By the looks of him, he looks like, um, he could be, like, partially a vampire or, like, partially transformed. I don't know what they, these guys are. I'm um, especially the guy who he's seen the most of with the, and he has, like, sort of, like, an, 
so how are you guys? You know, he has like that kind of voice. And sort of like a Rorschach type of voice, I want to say. And yeah, they basically take out all the vampires and then they lead the nanny and her daughter and the kids out. And he basically lines them up and checks all of them, you know, for bite, mark, bite marks or anything like that. And, you know, all the kids would get passed, and then the nanny gets passed, and then the daughter, you know, she actually got a little bit nipped on the hand by one of the vampire's tongues. And, you know, she says, you know, it's just a little bit, I'll be fine. And then he's like, you know, of course you will. And, and then he lets all of them pass before the other guys, you know, hold the kids and the nanny back. And, you know, he basically just shoots her and kills the daughter. And then, of course, Nanny, that was her daughter, you know, she freaks out and, you know, is just horrified by all of that. And that's basically where the episode ends. So, yeah, pretty crazy ending. I mean, from the Tom scene at the train station, that was cool enough. But this, I didn't really see coming. I haven't read the books, so I'm not familiar with this character that they just introduced here. But he does seem really interesting and... You know, I sort of understand that they're trying, you know, their goal is probably to exterminate any vampire they come across, you know, prevent it if they can, you know, no matter who they are, how far along they are, they just need to kill them. They're like the biggest realists in this world, basically. So, yeah, this guy seems really interesting. Again, I'm not sure what he is. He's clearly not human, or at least not fully human. So it's going to be inter interesting to see what more they show the character. You know what it's going to be like when he crosses over with the others or a little bit more invested in. So, yeah, that's pretty much this week's episode. So, yeah, I remember seeing that guy in the preview, but I kind of forgot about it. So it was kind of a surprise when he showed up and did all that. So some really awesome stuff, though. It looked awesome. He looks awesome. He seems like a really interesting character. So I'm curious to see what they do with him and what more is revealed about him in the episodes ahead. And that's the episode for this week. Again, a really, really solid episode. And, you know, the, this show is just so consistent from week to week. I know I say that almost every video I do about it, but, you know, it's been renewed for, it's been renewed for season two. You know, they're going to be filming in November for season two, and then it's going to air next summer. So I'm really happy about that. And, you know, just a very consistent show. It's really, really impressive to me. And I can't wait to see how this season continues and how it ends. It's going to be really epic, I have a feeling. So, yeah, pretty awesome stuff. And, yeah, I'll catch you guys most likely next week, unless I think of another video to do before then. But you'll definitely see me next Monday, you know, for my weekly strain review. But, again, I'll be starting school, so, you know, it's going to come a little bit, a few hours later than normal. So, yeah, I'll catch you guys then or before. We'll see. And, yeah, Strain is a great show. And, uh, peace.